Hello, Marissa. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me. So today's topic is about estate planning. Um, and one might wonder how this topic came up. <laughs> so really what happened, uh, dear listeners, is that uh, I realized I don't know anything about this. Effectively, I'm putting together a will and thinking about what's going to happen if something were to happen to me, to my assets and, and all that. And uh, I started really going down uh, the rabbit hole of trying to figure out how things properly get distributed to, to other people. Um, and it dawned on me that there are probably a lot of people in my position. Um, you know, most people buy their first home in DC sometime in their 30s. That's the average age, I think, is 32. Um, and so you're starting to kind of put together your plans for life and you buy your first home, but you don't typically think about what you're going to do if you are no longer around and you still own that home and you have a mortgage and, and all that. And so I thought this would be a really good opportunity for us to talk about it. And of course, the hope is that we all live to be 100 and that we you know, properly have our wills set up and everything like that so that we don't really have to deal with a lot of what we're going to discuss on this call today. Or, but you know, um, but it's good for us to all understand how it works. So anyway, Marissa, thank you so much for coming on because you're going to help make this uh, a lot more understood for a lot of people, I think. <laughs> well, I'll certainly try. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess we can just start with the basics. Like if something were to happen to me, let's just, we'll talk about me. Um, and I own a condo. Um, what happens? What happens to that home? Certainly. So the first thing that you would look at and that the law would look at is your deed. The deed is going to control the conveyance of the property after the homeowner passes away. There are generally about three ways that most people own property. The first type is of course an individually held property. It's all you, no other co-owners, no spouse. And so then it's fairly easy. What happens when you pass away is that that property passes through what's called probate. Probate is the court supervised process by which a decedent's assets move from that individual to whoever is named, whether there's a will or whether the person died without a will. Most people tend to own property with a spouse or a partner. And that's where things get a little bit more complicated. There are a couple of different ways to own it. So the first type is what's called tenants in common. And when you own a property as tenants in common, each person has their own individual undivided right to a percentage of the property. So let's say you and your sister have a condo. You each have a 50% one divided interest. And then that interest that you individually own passes through probate at your death to the folks you have named in your will or that the law puts in place for you if you don't have a will. And if your sister isn't that person, she only retains that 50% interest and then she's owning it with whoever, hmm. which can make for some really interesting, you know, property arrangements. So that's tenants in common. Okay. The other type of property ownership is what's called joint tenants with rights of survivorship. So in that situation, when one property owner passes away, his or her interest is absorbed by the other person. And so then that other person owns 100% of the property. No probate, no need for a new deed. It's just owned by the other person. So that would be most like married couples, for example, right? Is that typically how the deed would be for them? So there's a special type of property ownership for married couples. Okay. And that is called <laughs> tenants by the entireties. <laughs> It is only available to married people, and it is the best, most secure way to own property if you're married. The reason that it is the easiest is that it has all of the benefits of joint tenants with rights of survivorship in that when one person in the couple passes, the property goes to the survivor without probate. It also has the benefit of protecting both people in the couple from creditors because each of you is assumed to have a 100% total interest in the house. So that means if you get into a car accident and you're getting sued by the other person, they have no ability to attach to your home because it is owned also with this other person who has a 100% interest. So they can't get it. Huh. Okay. So that's, that's generally what I recommend for married couples. Yeah. That makes sense. Do you but see, then of so course, I mean, 
Go ahead. Yeah, well, I was going to say, what happens if, um, and we might be jumping ahead, but whatever, this is a free-flowing conversation. So if you, um, like, let's say I own my condo right now, this is real life. I own a condo in Logan Circle before I knew my fiance. Mm -hmm. And let's pretend we're already married and now I have a husband. So I have a deed that does not have him on it. Do you change the deed or is that something you cover in a will instead? Like what's the best way to deal with that kind of situation? Certainly. So what you don't do is rely on your will alone. Because even if your will says, I give everything to me, my fiance or to my husband or to my child or to my dog or to a charity, <laughs> it doesn't matter because the deed will control. So if you're owning it jointly with somebody else, it's going right to them. Right. And then it'll go, you know, via probate, it'll go to the people you have named in your will, but there's that extra step. So in that situation, if when you decide you want to do this, I would recommend probably a new deed, uh, ideally after you're married, so you get all the tenants by the entirety's benefits. Right. And it would be a deed from Allison to Allison and new husband as tenants by the entirety. Hmm. Um, is that, I'm just curious, maybe you don't know, but is that, is that costly? Is that something that's just like easy? Is it fast? Is, I mean, how, how quickly does that get done? Yeah, it's really not a cumbersome process. Certainly, I would recommend having an attorney assist you with right. preparing that deed. So it would be the cost, you know, for that attorney's time and the recordation. There are not recordation taxes on a conveyance like that because almost every state has an exemption for those sorts of things. But there are always, you know, small recording fees and those sure. sorts of things. So essentially, as soon as the attorney can get it done and you sign it and they're able to get it recorded in the land records, you're all set. Yeah, I know. I mean, I imagine that that um, I have not advised anyone on this, to be frank, because clearly I don't even know much of this myself. But um, a common question I always get is about fees and things like that. Um, so when you're doing any a normal closing of a property or a refinance, you're paying various fees. And when you're closing on a purchase, your recordation and transfer taxes are the biggest, you know, mm -hmm. tax and extra cost you're paying. Um, it tends to surprise people who haven't done a lot of research about the process before. So I do get a lot of like money questions, obviously. Um, and if I have to refer to an attorney or to a, a tax professional, then I do that. But it's just good for me to kind of understand that it's not very expensive and it's not very cumbersome. No. And it's important to do. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if, uh, okay, so back, sorry. So you, let's go back. So you were saying there was a three different kinds of, uh, deed types and, um, so you talk to keep talking about probate. Like <laughs> what if you don't want to go through probate? Sure. And most people don't. <laughs> and a lot of my job is helping people to set up certain structures to avoid probate. It has a lot of downsides. It is costly. It takes a long time and it's all public record. Anybody with an internet connection and a little bit of know-how has the ability to look and find out a lot about a person's assets and who's getting them. And that can open up the survivors to potential bad actors who are looking for people who have inherited assets and maybe, you know, they don't have their best interests at heart. Wow. I never, ever, ever, ever thought of that. So, so, Unfortunately, okay. I've wow. seen it a lot. Wow. Okay. So well, that's, yeah. Yeah. So what we do, there are a couple of different ways to avoid probate. The most comprehensive is to do estate planning where you create what's called a revocable living trust. And that is a separate legal entity that you convey property to that holds it separate from your individual interest. And so it provides continuity of ownership upon a person's incapacity or death. So say you and you know, your fiance get married and you guys want to do some estate planning. One thing that we would think about is potentially putting your property into a trust and that way, if both of you pass away or if you become incapacitated, that trust, which is the owner of the property, continues on no matter what happens to you and your husband. And so your successor trustees are able to manage it just like you can without the need for any court intervention. So selling, refinancing, renting, 
any of those sorts of things. It has that continuity. And of course, trust has a lot of other benefits. Yes. I'm raising my hand for those of you who are watching, or aren't watching. So if you um, if you have multiple properties, do they go into the same trust or does each property get, get its own trust? That's an excellent question. If you have an investment property that is being rented, the structure I generally recommend is that each property be held by its own LLC, limited liability company. And then you have a holding company that owns each of your individual LLCs and then you have your trust, which owns the holding company. Got now, it. I know that seems like a lot of steps and it might seem unnecessarily complicated, but there is a reason for it. And the reason is we have those individual LLCs so that if you have a slip and fall in property A, the only asset that tenant can attach to for potential damages is property A. If you have an LLC that owns properties A, B, and C, and there's a slip and fall in property A, guess what? They are gonna claim damages and they're gonna to try to recover against property A, B, and C because they're all owned by the same entity. Well, this is why um, developers, they have a different LLC for each of their properties. Um, I mean, I've kind Absolutely. of alluded, yeah, I've alluded to that or talked about it, I think on this uh, podcast before but how if you want to go after, you know, a developer for some reason, something, you know, tragic happened at a property, you really only have the ability to um, to to get at that developer by that specific LLC that you're, you know, involved with. Even if they've done 7000 properties, you can't you can't attach to any of those other 6999. As long as they've set it up properly. Yes. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so anybody who is acting in a landlord position should avail themselves from those same protections. Yeah, that makes sense. This is good only, I mean, this is also good for landlords to be listening to because um, I mean, there are certain things you have to do in DC when you have a rental, like you have to, um, you have to set certain things up with DCRA, you have to, you know, claim things correctly, but we don't often talk about it like this and talk about LLCs and what that means for your personal, you know, the per place where you live versus your, your rental property how mm -hmm. to keep those separately from a liability standpoint. So absolutely, well, I, I'm learning a lot because I also own a rental. So um, <laughs> I feel like you and I are going to have a huge like four hour conversation after this recording <laughs> yeah. for you to help me through my life. <laughs> absolutely. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So sorry, I interrupted you. So I asked you about the trust. And so you have different LLCs, which go into a holding company, you believe, I believe you said, and then the trust owns or manages, I can't remember the verbiage, um, that. Yes, the trust owns the holding company. Okay. So you have so several layers of protection because you have all of your personally held assets in the trust. And of course, the last thing you want is slip and fall tenant for property A, trying to get the house you live in or your bank sure. accounts or right. your car, all of those sorts of things. So that's why we really separate it out. And yes, there are some administrative costs associated with that. But again, the, the liability protection is huge. Sure. Yeah. And then an, the, another way to potentially avoid probate is something called a transfer on death deed. So let's say for whatever reason, you're not doing a trust. It doesn't work for you or your family. What an individual can do is execute a transfer on death deed that says, upon my death, I give this property to this person. So during your life, you still own it. You can still rent it, sell it, refinance it. It's yours. But if you pass away and own that property, it goes directly to the person you've named, again, outside of probate. So that can be really helpful for folks who maybe don't have you know, other assets or don't determine that a trust works for them. The only downside for the transfer on death deed is that you cannot do it in Maryland. Maryland will not recognize that. Huh. Virginia and DC will. Well, uh, this brings us to a question I had, which uh, about the different jurisdictions and how things are different. I did an episode with an attorney, actually a real estate attorney, about I don't know five or six episodes about general differences between DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, you know, we talked about taxes and um, we talked about personal property and we talked about a bunch of stuff. But we didn't really talk about this because, well, that wasn't his area of expertise. And 
clearly I don't even know to ask those questions. So, <laughs> so maybe you can tell us a little bit of the differences because somebody listening to this could be thinking about all three or one of one specific jurisdiction. Absolutely. So they are different. All of these probate and inheritance rules are governed by the local, state, or commonwealth law. So when you're talking with an attorney, you always want to make sure that you're talking with somebody who is licensed in that location and has a lot of experience in that location because you can really trip yourself up because there are a lot of differences. So let's start with D.C. and Maryland because those two are fairly similar with the exception of the transfer on death deed issue. So... For either of those, if you die owning part or all of a property that isn't going to pass by some sort of survivorship provision, that property has to go through the probate process. You go to court, you get appointed as fiduciary, you're filing inventories and accounts a lot of times with the court, and then the estate has the ability to sell the property or to distribute it to whoever it needs to go to. So if your will says, give everything to my kids in equal shares, the estate would then do a deed from estate to child one, child two, and child three. But before you do that deed, you have to go through all of that court work. Or if you want to sell it, again, it would be the estate selling to Mary and John Smith. Virginia is very unique and it has an older style of property inheritance. So in Virginia, immediately upon the death of the person, the property passes like a rock to the folks named in the will or that the law decides who you want to get your property if you don't have a will. Hmm. The property is not probated. So immediately upon recordation of the will, whoever is named has the ability to sell it. It's not sold by the estate. The only times when property is sold by an estate is if a will specifically gives an estate the power to sell real estate, in which case you have a really interesting scenario where an executor of an estate pulls real estate back up into court supervision, takes it from those people who got the property, takes it and says, I'm selling it now. Sounds fun. It can be. <laughs> <laughs> the other situation is if a person dies without a will or the will doesn't give the estate the power to sell the real estate, but say there's a good reason that the estate needs to do so, then you go to court and get a court order allowing the estate to sell the property. Wow. So you have to keep track of all three jurisdictions. I imagine anybody who deals with this kind of stuff in the area has to be licensed or should be licensed in all three jurisdictions because, I mean, they're just... These areas are so close, literally, physically. Well, they are, and I am licensed in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Not all attorneys are because it can be really hard to keep in your yeah. mind, okay, where am I geographically Yeah. so that yeah. I can remember what I'm doing and follow all the rules. And all of this matters based on the place where the person resides, right? Based and on the it... location of the property. Oh, okay. So if I own a rental property in Virginia but I have my main home in the, where I live is in DC. Mm -hmm. Then we have to be cognizant of the fact that we've got two sets of laws governing what, what would happen. Absolutely. So in that situation, for example, you would have your primary probate in DC, and then you would have what's called ancillary probate in Virginia, which just means other probate in another state right. where you have real property. Again, you're talking about filing with the court going through the appointment process, getting the ability to sell the property if you need to. And when folks own property across state lines, that's usually a really good opportunity to, instead of having to go through that process, put all of the properties into a trust or into those separate LLCs if they are investment properties. Yeah. Man, I wish I should put together a class for my clients about this kind of stuff because I mean, it's one of those things where you don't know what you don't know. And until you have to think about this stuff for whatever reason, or in my case, I just was like, oh, you're 40. You should probably, you know, plan for not being, you know, around forever I and mean, sad, but it's life, you know? And um, I, I just think so many people are sort of what, so unaware of how this stuff works. Um, I don't know. 
I just, I, I think that there's a lot of room for education on this topic for people because it last thing you want when, if you, if I were to pass away unexpectedly, it would be for my family to like have to go through even more steps to deal with that and the end of that process, you know? So you're kind of doing everybody a favor if you get this stuff set up um, correctly uh, when you're younger. Um, you're absolutely right. It's hard yeah. to think about. It's hard to work on. But unfortunately, none of us are going to live forever. Well, yeah. And you've really I mean, I did, hit the nail on the head that this is a gift you give to your family. Yeah. I mean, I did an episode a couple of weeks ago about aging in place. I think you know the uh, guest that I had on, a uh, friend. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, some of these topics are not um, the most, you know, it's not as fluffy and exciting about talking about staging your house and things like that, but they're, <laughs> but they're important. They're extremely important. And they're, um, you know, they're, they're not that in this case, it's not that easy to, I think, um, to, to figure out on your own is the thing. Like personally, you know, my sister's a lawyer. I have plenty of friends who are lawyers. I've had lots of legal conversations in my life, but legalese and some of these terms and some of these options can be really confusing. Um, and so I think people seem, t they they stem, you know, they, they, they stay away from things that kind of make them uncomfortable or that are just hard to, to, to figure out. So um, I'm really glad we're talking about this. So I guess as we're kind of coming to a conclusion, if you had to give a couple of really like first steps, main pieces of advice for people. If they're in the beginning stages of trying to figure out how to deal with, with this planning for this, what, what advice would you give them? Where do you start or what should you do? Absolutely. So this is going to sound really self-serving, but I promise that it is true. You got to talk to a lawyer about it because sure. everybody's situation is so different. You know, I can talk about general advice and what people should think about. But if you come to me and give me specific situations or tell me, well, I've got property in Florida or I've got property in Canada, there might be completely different advice yeah. that I would need to give you or that any good attorney would give you. So it really is worth sitting down with a lawyer, having that hour long chat, giving them all your information and getting a good plan set up in place. The other thing I really recommend is look closely at the documents you do have. Take a look at your current deed. Take a look at your current beneficiary designation for your retirement plan. Take a look at your accounts. How are they titled? Do you have somebody named as joint that maybe you don't want them to get the assets? A lot of times we sort of flip through and we forget about things that we've designated that maybe are no longer accurate. Um, and especially after you have a big life change, whether good or bad, you, know, you welcome a new baby, or you say goodbye to a loved one, or you go through a divorce. You know, I know it's the last thing people want to think about, but these sorts of things are so important to really keep on top of. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking about uh, about all of this, obviously, before we started recording and thinking the people who probably have considered this and started these processes are those who who have done exa or have been through exactly what you were just saying, you know, maybe they um, got married, or especially if they've had a child, or if somebody's passed away that they love, and they've had to deal with this themselves. I kind of have this fear that there are people who did exactly what I did, who have no idea, got a 401k when they were 21. And I don't remember who I said as my beneficiary. Well, I, I certainly didn't for a long time. Bought my first home. I was very lucky when I was, I think, 28, 29, um, signed a bunch of stuff, you know, re refinanced, various things happened in my life where you just lose track. Um, and and you honestly, there got there was a very long time in my life where I wasn't thinking about what if I'm not here. You know, it's like the whole young gonna live forever thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I I think that this information and what we talked about today is is less important to get to somebody who's later in life because they've probably thought about these things before. But the people who haven't thought about them, who haven't really needed quote needed to yet, right? They don't have children. They're not. They're not. Um, they're not that worried about things yet. But the fact is exactly what we said before. If something were to ever happen, you're really helping the whole situation, everybody you love in getting this stuff kind of prepared and lined up um, the, to the best of your ability before, God forbid, you know, anything happens. Absolutely. And just don't delay. I, I have seen so many situations where grandma owned a house. And this one I'm thinking of was in DC. 
grandma owned a house and then didn't do anything, had four kids. None of them did anything except make sure that the property taxes were paid. And then you had two siblings pass away. So then you got four grandkids each. By the time they got to me, we're talking about 12 people having mm-hmm. disparate percentage interests in this property and that you've got to go through, sort out, you know, look at a potential partition of the asset. This stuff just gets messier and harder the longer yeah. you wait. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate you coming on. We are going to uh, definitely link all of your information in the show notes. So if anybody does want to start this journey of kind of getting things <laughs> put together, um, and also it makes people think about, you know, how when they're going through the process of buying their first place, of how the fact that you should put this on the list of things to consider and kind of do as you're you know, getting ready to buy your home. So anyway, Marissa, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to send people your way and thanks for answering my questions too. Oh, well, you bet. Thanks so much, Allison. This was fun. 